But we are going back to our series called Renew. And we are all about renewing our lives. And so far, we have discussed Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 1 through 14. In those verses, the Apostle Paul introduced himself briefly, and then he dives into these spiritual blessings. And he's talking about these amazing things that God has done for us and blessed us with. And those spiritual blessings renew us. They make us new and different. So in verses 3 through 11, he gives this list of spiritual blessings for us. And then um, in verses 12 through 14, he tells us that the Holy Spirit has come and sealed us. And it's God's proof that he's going to complete his work and that someday we will be in his presence and we will live in heaven with him. And, and we can know that because the Spirit is active in our lives. Well, that puts us at verse 15. So I would encourage you to find Ephesians chapter 1 and starting at verse 15. And uh, in these verses, the Apostle Paul is going to make an interesting shift. Like he's been in this in this mode of just going down through information and listing information and, and it's it's pretty heavy teaching, but but now he's going to shift into a prayer. And he's going to talk about the prayer that he's praying for these people. And we're going to look at that today and, and just ask ourselves, like, why, why is he sharing this prayer? And the, the question is, like, is he sharing this prayer because uh, he wants them to know that he's praying and, and well, kind of brag, okay, I'm, I'm praying about you, or just assure them that he's praying for them? I, I don't think so. First of all, my thought is that the Apostle Paul is an extremely organized person. I mean, when you read his information in, in any of his letters, he is extremely organized. And he uses extremely long uh, sentences. Like, he is the master of the run-on sentence. Uh, like, whole paragraphs, maybe even several paragraphs, is, is one sentence in the Greek. But... Um, but what he's doing here is he's sharing his prayer for them as a way of discipling them. He's trying to tell them this. This is what's important. This is what you need to focus on. This is what you need to be praying for yourself. And so as we read these verses, like look at it and, and read it through those eyes and ask yourself, like, how does this, how does this fit for me? All right, so Ephesians 1, starting at verse 15, says this. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord, the Lord Jesus, and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the, and the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. Wow, that's quite the sentence, isn't it? But that's his prayer for them. And so here's a brief outline. Uh, first, in verse 15, he celebrates their faith and love. He's like, this is awesome. I love how you believe in God and how well you love each other and love God. And then he gives thanks for them in verse 16. He's like, I, I thank God for you. And when you see a group of people really living Jesus, it's a cool thing. And he's like, I'm so thankful for you guys. Because you guys are doing so well. And then he, he intercedes for them. He's, he has this prayer. He's like, this is how I pray when I think of you. And he's interceding for them. 
And because the Apostle Paul details his intercession for them, I mean, he goes into great detail here, doesn't he? I want to focus on that structure. And so we're going to pick his prayer apart and really look at what he's doing there. And the first part of that is he prays that they will receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation. I got to looking at that and... And I thought, wow, okay, what's he, what's he really saying there? And there's a couple key words that I really want to stop and explore with you. The, the first word is wisdom. Now, the Greek word there is Sophia. Um, and that, words, that word in the Greek describes a diverse range of understanding. It's the type of understanding that isn't just about data. It's about really understanding how it applies to life. So he's, he's praying that they have a type of wisdom that isn't just stuff that they memorize, but it's that it impacts their lifestyle and, and really affects how they do life. But that isn't the only word he uses to describe this, this spirit that he wants inside of them. He also uses the word revelation. Now, in the Greek, the Greek word is apocalypsis. And when I say that, you probably think, oh, apocalypse. I know what apocalypse is. Well, we tend to use the word apocalypse like the end of the world, you know, um, post-apocalyptic world. Now, apocalypse in the Greek actually means this, this sense of um, to, to disclose or make visible, to, to, uh, to really understand the deep aspect of it. And when it's used in religious context, it, it, it talks about a God showing up. Um, the, the word we would use is theophany. You've maybe never heard that word, but theophany is when uh, God becomes visible. So Jesus is our theophany. Okay? And so he's praying that they have a theophany experience where God shows up in, in such a real way that they go like, ta-da, and the angels sing, and like, wow, Jesus was right here. And he's praying that they have that kind of experience with God. But that, again, isn't just the only word. Um, he's, he's praying that they have, like, I would call it an epiphany, like, wow. And, and he prays that they would have those experiences so that they would know God better. And again, the word know uh, in the Greek is epigonosko. Now, the Apostle Paul could have used a variety of words for knowledge there. He, he had a choice of words. And again, each word has its subtle meaning difference. This one isn't about general data. This one is about a personal first-hand experience. Uh, it's like I witnessed an accident firsthand. I was there. I experienced it. I saw it. I have firsthand knowledge. I understand exactly how this thing went down. And uh, basically, he's praying that they would have the type of knowledge that Moses had at the burning bush. Or when he walked away from that burning bush, he was like, oh, wow. That was God, and that was powerful. And the Apostle Paul is begging God that they would have a spirit in them where they would experience God in these ways. And so... Why? Why is he praying these things? He's praying it so that their, the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened. He wants them to have enlightened hearts. Here, here's my thought. I, I'm wondering if the Apostle Paul had this thought, and he goes back to Acts chapter 9, where he's riding on his horse, and he's oppressing the church, and God shows a bright light, knocks him off his horse, blinds him physically, and enlightens his heart for the first time. The Apostle Paul walked away from that experience physically blind. 
But his heart understood God in a whole new way. And he's praying that these guys have some kind of experience like that because up until that time, the Apostle Paul had associated with God through rules and rituals. He was a Pharisee. In fact, he even said, I was, I was one of the greatest Pharisees ever. I was good at being a Pharisee. I was keeping all the rules. I had all the rituals down to a science. I was doing really, really well. And then God showed up. And, and so there's these rules, these rituals that he used to do. But once he had this face-to-face -face -face encounter with Jesus, everything changed, didn't it? His life was not the same. So as I read this, I, I asked myself a question. What kind of revelations do I have of Jesus? What, what kind of experience do I have with Jesus? When, when I stop and pray and when I study the Word, do I just gather more data? Or, or do I see more rules that I should follow, more rituals I, I should do? Or do I, do I have these personal encounters with, with Jesus where I walk away going like, my heart is just radiating with the power and the presence of God. To be honest with you, sometimes, sometimes things click and sometimes they don't. Sometimes I walk away from my personal private time with Jesus in the morning and go like, yeah! And, and I have a hard time setting my Bible down and closing my prayer time and getting the various jobs that I have to do that day done. Um, other times I, I get done and I go like, ah, I, I, I wish it would have connected more. I wish, I wish it would have been more than just data. But overall, are we shooting for a relationship with God? that just lights us up from the inside, where we can say the eyes of our hearts saw the light. That's what we're shooting for. Well, next, in verses 18 through 23, the Apostle Paul breaks this enlightenment of our hearts into three areas for us to experience. He talks about the hope of God's invitation. He talks about the riches of their inheritance. And he talks about the immeasurable power of God in us. So let's, let's just break that down and talk about them. He wants us to see the hope of God's invitation. That God has invited us into a, a sense of hope and joy that is way beyond anything that this world could offer us. And when we hope in that, that sets the course of where we're going. Because our hopes and dreams set the course for our lives, right? What I'm hoping for, what I'm working towards, determines all the things that I'm doing in my life. And so let's ask ourselves this question, what are the hopes and dreams of my life? What am I really working towards? If I was to sit down and really analyze what it is that I see as important, what am I shooting for? Maybe, maybe you're shooting for like a great career, or maybe you're, you're really focused on being rich and powerful. Maybe you had thoughts of being famous. Uh, maybe not. Maybe you went a completely different way. Maybe, maybe your thought was, you know, I just, I want to enjoy life. I, I want it to be about enjoyment. Or maybe it's, I, I want to build a great family. I, I want to be, you know, this great family that's deeply connected with each other. Now, the, the Apostle Paul didn't make any of those his goal. He wasn't interested in any of that. Here's, here's what he really was excited about, suffering and death. 
He's like, God, that's what I really want for my life. For instance, in Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11, he creates this mission statement. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Isn't that interesting? He's like, I really want to connect with Christ, and the way to do that is suffering and death. That's what I'm into. So that was the goal of his life. I think one of our greatest risks in life is to set our goals in the wrong areas. Because our society is constantly telling us it's about what you have, it's about what you do, it's about how big a name you have, it's about how much you have, right? And pretty soon we find ourselves drifting that direction of wanting more and doing more and accomplishing more, right? And pretty soon we're distracted from what really makes a difference. So how do we go that direction? How do we stay on course? with wanting to know Christ, to experience his power, and to join him in suffering and death. How do we do that? Well, the Apostle Paul prays that the eyes of our hearts will be enlightened to God's immeasurable power. And he makes a big deal out of this immeasurable power. power. In fact, if you look at these verses, you get to see that um, he's talking from verse 19 through verse 23 about power. That's a fairly significant chunk of information where he is focused on the power of God in our lives. And in that section, he actually talks about two different kinds of power that God has and that he's offering us. So in verses 19 through 20, he says the first kind of power is the kind of power that resurrected Jesus from the dead. And then he goes into a bit of a dis description there. And basically what he's trying to get his readers to envision is what kind of power does it take to take a, a body that's dead for three days, a, a body that's decomposing, and jolt it back to life? Come on, just picture that kind of power. Like, wow. We don't have anything like that, do we? But that's the kind of power that our God has and wants for us. It, the Apostle Paul says he places that kind of power inside of us. So, is there a problem that God can't solve? Because sometimes we treat him like he, he... It's like, God, okay, this is a complicated problem. I'll handle it for you. <laughs> right? We, we take it into our own hands, and we try to fix it. And God's like, oh, really? But we treat him like he doesn't know what he's doing, and he can't really solve it. We, we doubt him. We, we act like he isn't big enough, he isn't strong enough, and he, he isn't smart enough to solve the problems of our life. And the Apostle Paul says, he took a dead body and jolted it back to life. What do you mean he can't do that? So why is it that we don't trust him? Why is it that we don't trust God? You know, I, I think one of the big struggles is that we don't know him. Not, I mean, we don't know him at a level where we, we can trust him. Like when you're in trouble, like the car breaks down in the middle of nowhere, who, who do you call? Sometimes you call in an expert, right? Someone you don't know. But oftentimes, you call someone you know. You, you call someone that you feel you can trust. Because you know that person. That person is maybe family. That person might be a friend. But it's someone where you go like, I know this person loves me, and I know this person's going to step up for me. And maybe the reason we don't trust God is we don't know him. And that the eyes of our hearts haven't been enlightened, connected, where we go like, he 
loves me. He has the power. I've experienced it. I saw it. It stood right in front of me. And because we haven't really experienced it, we don't trust him. Now, it says that, that God not only raised him from the dead, but he brought him up into the heavenlies and seated him next to himself. And this is a second kind of power in verses uh, 22 and 23. This, this second kind of power is, is, I would call it authority. He positioned Jesus as the authority over everything and everyone. Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of God with all power and all authority and everything and everyone is underneath him. And, and he has been positioned there so that everything physical and spiritual is submitting to him. And not only are they doing that now, but they do that for all eternity. And so in everything... Jesus is head of over everything. And then in verses 22 and 23, he specifies that Jesus is also head of the church, who is his body. Now, just like our bodies respond to our heads, we, the church, need to be responding to the thoughts and desires of Jesus. And that's... That's just absolutely essential. Now, I was thinking that Jim, Jim Smith would probably be here, but he isn't. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, Jim is a state trooper. And, and so when, when he wears the uniform and he wears the badge, he represents the authority of the state of Iowa. And so he can walk out into traffic, hold out his hand, and people stop, at least usually. And they do that because he wears the uniform, he wears the badge, and he has been given the authority to do that, and he wears a gun. <laughs> and when he holds out his hand, they stop. That's the authority he has been given. Jim also loves superheroes. And he, he doesn't have superhero abilities. But let's take Superman, for instance. Superman can hold out his hand and stop a car, not because he has authority, but because he has power. Because the car can't push hard enough and isn't big enough and strong enough to out-push Superman. And so... Superman holds out his hand and holds back a car. He doesn't have the badge and he doesn't have the uniform. So technically he doesn't have the authority, but he does have the power. But Jesus, Jesus has both the power and the authority together. And that's the position that he's in. And so that's why we as elders have adopted this, this value that says Jesus first. At JBF, we, we are obsessed about Jesus. Why? Because he has the power, and he has the authority, and it's our job to follow him. Because we're, we're the church. Out of, out of all the groups in the world, the church should reflect this picture of following Jesus and believing in his power and believing in his authority and aligning ourselves with him. And we as elders, we've talked about the concept that technically we as elders, are, we're, we're not really the leaders of the church. We're the first followers. It's our job to listen to Jesus and be the first to jump in line with what Jesus is saying for our church, and then call the rest of the church and say, Jesus is saying, go that way. And to let the rest of the church know, this is where we believe that Jesus wants us to go. And so just think of a church that actually believes that Jesus has the power, that Jesus has the authority, is listening for Jesus and responding to everything he wants. Like, how does that look 
And how awesome would that be to be really good at that? And the Apostle Paul is praying that these people look like that. And here's what, I, here's what I just, please be praying that we are like that. Because nothing, nothing could be better than to have a church that's just fully aligned with the power and the authority of Jesus, listening to him and doing what he's called us to do. And so each of us needs to just stop and ask ourselves, like, am, am I having these encounters with Christ where the eyes of my heart are enlightened? To where I know God's invitation to me and where he wants me to go, that I understand the riches of my inheritance and how my hope lies in that direction and God's immeasurable power and authority so that everything in my life aligns and follows him and taps into what he wants for my life. Because when I do that, I unleash all of the spiritual blessings that he's already taught us. All right, so I'm going to give you a minute to just bow your head, to pray, to connect with Jesus, and talk to him about that right now. And then I'll close this in prayer in just a minute. Father, together we pray that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we would personally experience you face to face. We pray that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened so that we would know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance and your incomparably great power for us. We come to you asking that you would unleash on us that same power you exerted when you raised Jesus from the dead and you seated him at your right hand in the heavenly realms. And we celebrate that you have placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything, especially us. And now we offer ourselves to you as the body of Christ. And we ask that we would experience the fullness of Jesus Christ in our lives every way, in every way and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.